Good morning. It is a privilege to be able to worship alongside y'all this morning. And um, as said earlier, we are beginning a journey for the next six weeks together uh, with the phrase, the struggle is real. Uh, Because life is more often than not challenging. And sometimes we don't know what to do, especially when we are stuck. And, And I feel very often that it can be easily to get stuck in the struggle and forget the hope that we have in Jesus, the great I am in whom we have the victory. And so for these next six weeks, we're gonna talk about questions that we might all struggle with, but we're also gonna talk about hope and what we can find in a biblical response to these questions. And so today, we're gonna talk about what do I do when fear overwhelms me? And we're gonna learn and study about that in the narrative of Jesus walking on water. You know, very often I feel like this is us, right? Standing and the storm is raging and we just have no idea what is going on because the struggle is very real. And it gets me to think about this movie that came out when I was in college. Uh, Back in 2000, there was a movie that came out called The Replacements. It's a football movie, it's a sports movie, so I was immediately, I'm going to watch this. And what it is, is about uh, a a professional football league. Uh, These players that are professional, they go on strike. And in order for the season to continue, they have to bring in replacement players, right? So it begins this pulling all these different players together from all over and making a football team to take them to become a cohesive unit, And there's one scene at the midpoint of the movie where they're in a team meeting and the coach is talking to them and saying, hey, I want to talk about fear. And he wants to talk about fear because he wants the team to kind of come together. He wants them to know what each other's struggles are. And so some of the players don't fully understand what he's asking about fear. And so some of them reply in a comic way as one player said, spiders. One player said bees, and the coach is like, hold on, let's pause for a second, let's go deeper. And so the quarterback, played by Keanu Reeves, Shane Falco says quicksand. And he explains it in this manner. He says that you are playing and you think everything is going fine. Then one thing goes wrong, and then another, and another. You try to fight back, but the harder you fight, the deeper you sink until you can't move, you can't breathe, because you're in over your head, like quicksand. And again, as we said earlier, we often feel that is life, that we're sinking or drowning in fear and anxiety. But the word of God says, do not be afraid 365 times. And this is God telling us to not let anxiety, panic, doubt, restlessness, and angst to rule and dominate our lives. That we can't let it become so rooted in our hearts because Christians are not supposed to be a people of panic and fear. We're called to be a people of faith. And that's what we're going to study today in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. And it reads this, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. You know, right before this story begins, we see in Matthew that Jesus had just finished performing the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And when you count women and children, literally fifteen to 20,000 were fed. Jesus saw the people in need, and he provided for their needs with this miracle. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 was a lesson on faith that God wanted to teach the disciples that he would provide for them their needs, to teach the Israelites, the Jews, that he would provide for their needs. But with the story of Jesus walking on the sea, there was another lesson to be taught by Christ himself. And in verse 22, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. We see here, that Jesus told the disciples to get on the boat and go without him. Immediately, right? Miracle done, time to go. Jesus knew what was going to happen. But imagine the disciples feeling at this very moment, right? We just did this huge thing. We saw Jesus perform this miracle and now he wants us to go without him? Well, let me say this. Anytime we study the text, we need to always show grace to the people in it. Because this was all happening in real time for them. We have the privilege to read about this 2,000 years later. And guess what? We still mess it up, even from the lessons that we're learning from here. But the disciples are asking one another, why is Jesus leaving us? Why would he go away from us? Because again, Jesus said it's time to go. I'll see y'all later on. We continue in verse 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When the evening came, he was there alone. So remember the huge deal about the feeding of the 5,000, the amazing miracle that testified to his messianic power. And we see often in the Gospels that Jesus usually retreated from the crowds in order to rest, recharge, and reconnect with his father. And this is where introverts are like, yes. But I do want to camp out here for just a little bit because this phrase, this verse is so often overlooked in this study of this passage that is hugely significant to our spiritual journey into becoming more like Jesus. Jesus went away by himself to pray. Solitude with God is necessary in every believer's life. A Christian must have an intentional alone time with God where you are talking to him, where you are processing life with him. There has to be time with God where there is no extra noise in our lives in order to focus well on him and him alone. But unfortunately, in today's society, we have tricked ourselves to thinking that a few minutes a day with God will suffice as quality time. And I promise you, it doesn't work that way. Because when spending time with God, you should be patient as he is with us. You should feel refreshed and reinvigorated after you cast your burdens on him. And that doesn't happen unless there is deep, intentional time with him. You don't get spiritual death when you are doing the eight-minute abs version of spiritual training. And so, maybe you don't know how to have an intentional time with God. I want to encourage you today that God is pleased with you taking that first step of faith and saying, I want to pray more. I want to be connected to you more. God is pleased with that. What if you've been doing alone time with God for quite some time to where it's kind of routine, it's kind of comfortable, right? Good job at doing that. But God is saying, hey, we can challenge you to go deeper, to spend more time with me, to not just look at it as part of your routine. And so now, we're in January, it's the beginning of a new year. Fresh start, we all get to do and start new things. This is a great time to begin having intentional, solitude, quality time with God alone. And so when we look at this passage, I often think, like, what was Jesus praying about? Right, because he spent time alone with God, and it doesn't say right here, but I imagine he was debriefing with God what just happened in the feeding of the 5,000. 
You know, in the John narrative, in John 6, 15, we saw that the Israelites wanted to physically, physically take Jesus and make him their earthly king. Maybe he was praying for their hearts to see him more than that, but as their heavenly savior. We don't know, but we know that Jesus was a man of prayer. And we see in verse 24 that Jesus is praying in the night. We see this scene, right? Imagine you're in a movie, you're watching a show, and it's close in on Jesus praying. And then we pan out to the disciples. They're getting on the boat to journey it to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They begin their journey and their many stadia into their trip, which is measurements of 105 meters or more. And in John, it says that they had rowed three or four miles, but not just in calm water, in strong waves and heavy winds. That sounds like a fun scenario to row a boat in, doesn't it? I don't know why they didn't just pull out the motor and go. It would have been a lot faster. And so we continue, though, in, in verses 25 and 26 and 27. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. The fourth watch of the night, the Romans, the way they did time, they didn't have watches like we do. They broke the night into four quarters. And so it began from 6 to 9 p.m. would be quarter number one. Quarter number two is 9 to 12 a.m. Quarter number three is 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. So the fourth quarter would be... Some were really confident in their answer. Some were kind of like, three to six. Yes, so three to six a.m. is when Jesus comes to them. And so let's rewind. Nine hours they were rowing in a storm. But let's zoom out of that again and go back. Jesus prayed alone with God for nine hours as well. Right? Going back to solitude time. But back to the disciples. They've been rowing for nine hours. And I don't know how many people in here have rowed or whatever. My closest experience is when I do cardio in a gym. Uh, well, let me, I like weights. I hate cardio. Cardio is of the devil. Amen, yes. But my heart needs to be stronger. And my wife says she needs me to be healthy. And so when I do cardio, I like to do the rowing machine because I get on there 15, 20, 30 minutes. I'm done. I'm spent. I'm good. Now, if I did that for nine hours, there's no way. There is no way I would be exhausted. And so imagine the disciples. They're tired. They're scared. So it's a good thing that Jesus walks up on them on the sea. Let me say that again because I think we overlook this miracle that Jesus walks on the sea because a lot of us heard in children's church growing up, right, Jesus walking on water was a really cool miracle. And that's kind of what we hear. And as adults, we kind of lose sight and awe of this miracle. Jesus walked on the sea to his disciples. Again, when I was preparing for this message, my ADD mind went to the, like, I wonder how he got there. Like, did he fly? Did he teleport? Did he walk? Did he run? I don't know. That's, that's one of the answers I look forward to knowing when I'm in heaven. I can ask him. But we see in this moment in verse 26, the disciples are terrified. And again, understanding their fatigue and exhaustion after doing a long day of ministry and rowing all night, they're going to be tired. When we are tired, our mind is not sharp. Our eyes may not see clearly. And when that happens, things can start to unravel. And so when we see Jesus walking on the sea to them, the Greek gives us the visual example that he is walking in a normal human stride in the midst of stormy seas. Not one of being tossed left and right to and from by the seas, but a normal walking stride. We see here Jesus' power over nature. So we've seen his demonstration of power twice now with the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the sea. I love to close my eyes and visualize what is written in Psalm 77, 19, which says, Your way was through the sea, your path through through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. And in Job 9, 8, who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? The disciples are terrified because they're tired. They're literally stirred up with fear and greatly trouble. But if we look back in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, this isn't the first time that the disciples were on a boat in a storm on the sea. 
That last time, they were literally fearing for their lives, and Jesus commanded the storm to stop, to show, I am the Son of God. I have power over nature. Well, we see in this text right here that they're in this storm. They're not fearing for their lives. Instead, they're scared that they see a ghost. They feel that they see an apparition or a spirit. And so here we have a different scenario, but the same result, fear. Because there was an urban legend, a, a Hellenistic legend, myth, that when someone died on the Sea of Galilee, their spirit would remain there to haunt whoever would be on the waters. And so understanding that, you could see that the disciples were not superstitious, but they might have been a little stitious. And the disciples are crying out in fear because they're scared, they're tired, they're out of control, and they think they're alone. But Jesus, in verse 27, Jesus doesn't sit there and wait for them to calm down. He comforts them immediately because that is what a loving God does when he sees his children and followers in distress. And he says three things to them specifically. Take heart. This means to have courage. The Greek word for this is tharseo, which literally means to be firm or resolute in the face of danger or adverse circumstances. This is a positive command that Jesus gives to his disciples on what to do in the midst of fear and anxiety and in a storm. And why? The second statement. It is I. It is I. As I still read this today to this very moment, I can't help but be touched by the power of that statement. Because Jesus isn't just saying, hey guys, your bro's here. He's saying, I am is here. Not just your friend, not just your teacher, but your God is here with you in this storm. And this I am, he is referencing Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when God speaks to Moses through the burning bush. This is a reference to Isaiah chapter 40, excuse me, 43, verses 1 through 3, when God tells Israel that he has been with them in their captivity, been with them in their hopelessness. Jesus, the great I am, the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, the vine, the I am is here with you in your time of fear, anxiety, and doubt. So you can take courage. And not just take courage. He gives a third statement. He says, do not be afraid. Jesus gives them a negative command now on what not to do in the face of fear. He's saying literally, fear not. This statement, though, is an encouragement and not a rebuke. In the New Living Translation, it gives this specific order to don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. The theologian Donald A. Hagner says that fear is unwarranted where Jesus is present. And in the movie world, this would be a perfect place for a story to end. But Jesus still has more to teach the disciples. And we continue in verses 28 through 31. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. The story shifts the focus from all of the disciples to one specific one, Peter. Everyone's favorite, good old Peter. We all know about Peter, right? As we see in the text, he's the brash disciple, the one who often speaks too quickly, the one who seems to overpromise and underdeliver, right? He would never leave Jesus aside, but he denied him. He cut off a Roman soldier's ear. He's reckless, and we see a man whose faith journey is often up and down. But the reality, when we look at Peter, we often see ourselves as well. Because I know for me specifically, I often feel like Peter more than I do the Apostle Paul. But one thing we might lose sight of in this, in Peter's recklessness, is that Peter is bold. He doesn't question Jesus in this instance. What he's saying when he's saying, if it's you, he's saying, since it is you, since it is you, Jesus, tell me to come to you. Tell me to get out of the boat and walk to you because I want 
to come to you. I want to be with you where the storm is not affecting you. Peter is asking Jesus for a sign, not like the hypocrites that we see in Matthew 12 and in Matthew 16 where they wanted to put him to the test. Peter has a faith in Jesus. Jesus saw that faith. And so Jesus says, come. Come to me. Peter gets out of the boat and walks on water. Peter doesn't just get out of the boat. He immediately gets out of the boat. No hesitation. Jesus says, come. Okay. And just as Jesus walked on the sea, Peter walks in the same manner. Regular human stride in the midst of the storm. Because he's focused on his Savior and walking towards his Savior. But fear. But fear because in verse 30, out of the corner of his eye, he sees a large crashing wave. He feels his body uh, the strong winds hitting his body, and he's realizing that this is not a real ideal environment to be walking in or on. It reminds me of like when I drive on I-10. Y'all can, y'all can, y'all probably, everyone in here can understand. When you're driving on the inside lane and you're stuck between that concrete barrier and an 18-wheeler, right, and you're scared to look to your right because you might go into them or you look left, you might hit the concrete barrier. So you're just like, I'm going to look forward. I'm going to accelerate just a little bit more and pray that the Lord doesn't want me to get in a wreck today. Right, because when you do look to your right, you can't help but swerve a little to the right. When you look to your left, you can't help but swerve a little. So you need to look forward. That's what Peter was trying to do. But the storms of life were just enough of his distraction that he took his eyes and his focus off of his Lord, off of the I am. And so he panics as he sees chaos. In his situation, he has forgotten about everything he has learned and seen Jesus do up to this point in his journey alongside him. He forgot about Jesus cleansing the leper. He forgot about Jesus curing a Roman centurion servant. He forgot that he saw Jesus heal a fever and calm a storm and cast out demons. He forgot that he saw Jesus heal a paralytic. He forgot about Jesus healing the woman with the blood issue and raising a little girl from the dead. He forgot about seeing Jesus open the eyes of a blind man, making the mute speak, healing a man with a withered hand. Literally, he forgot about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And he forgot these things because in the midst of the storm he was experiencing, he took his eyes and mind off of his Lord. In his circumstances, his fear had him forget the truth and the hope that he had learned, seen, and experienced because of Jesus. And that's what an uncontrolled fear, that's what uncontrolled anxiety can do to a believer's life. It will make you forget about the goodness of God. And it will happen very easily because in the midst of junk, it is easy to lose sight of everything that we have experienced because of Jesus Christ. And so Peter cries out, Lord, save me. This is amazing. Peter should get lots of props for this because he realizes he can do nothing of his own accord to help or fix this situation. That Peter is desperate and there is nowhere to go and he cries out to the only one who can save him, the I am. Peter echoes the words from David in Psalm 69 verses 1 through 3. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. But we see in verse 31, Jesus immediately reaches into the stormy waters and pulls Peter up. Jesus rescues and saves Peter and tells him or asks him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? That seems kind of like an ouch statement, doesn't it? Well, it's kind of a yes and a no. And so I want to talk about this for just a little bit. Because growing up for me, I was always taught that Jesus was scolding Peter. That Peter was a failure because of his doubt and his fear. And so for me, as a high school student, as a middle school student, as a college student, that wrestled with my faith. Anytime I had doubts 
when life was, circumstances were bad, I felt guilty. I want to encourage you that that is hogwash, that Peter was not a failure. Peter was the one that stepped out onto the stormy seas. Not Andrew, not James, not John, not Philip, not Bartholomew, Thomas, or Matthew, not the other James, Thaddeus, or Judas, no comment on Judas regardless, but Peter. Peter stepped out in faith when Jesus said, come. And so when we look at this passage, we can see that Jesus is asking Peter in a loving and kind way, why didn't you trust me? I had you. And the word we see here with the word doubt is distazo. It means or refers to people who do, do believe that Jesus is Lord, that he is the one who rescues and saves, but still at the same time may have some lingering doubts. This is very different from the doubt of unbelievers, which is one uh, based on stubborn unbelief. This distazo is one that comes to us when life overwhelms us, when we are in the midst of life's storms, the storms that make even the strongest and faith-filled believers wonder where God is. Where is God's goodness? Where is his mercy? But it wasn't the size or amount of Peter's faith that Jesus was questioning. We see that Peter had faith because he stepped out onto the sea. Jesus was questioning why Peter lost focus and allowed life circumstances to distract him and have him forget about his Lord and Savior being the one that protected him, the one that provided for him and rescued him. This doubt will come to all of us. But the reality is, what will we do in the midst of this distazo? Will we stay in our own situation? Or will we try to fix it with our own power and just sink deeper and deeper? Or will we seek out and cry out to the I am? Yeah, that's worked pretty well. <laughs> we just get some soundtrack music too now. But in the midst of our storm, will we seek Jesus out with every muscle fiber of our being? Will we genuinely scream out, Lord, save me? Because Jesus is literally asking Peter, asking you, asking me, every time that we are filled with fear, doubt, and anxiety, he's asking, will you trust me? Do you trust me? And if you believe that Jesus is Lord of your life, will you trust him? But on the other side, maybe you don't know Jesus is Lord. Maybe you, maybe you don't know that he is the one who can rescue you. The same way Jesus rescued Peter from death, he can and will rescue you. And I'm not talking about a temporal death, the physical death that we will all experience, but I'm talking about an eternal death. And the word of God hopefully tells us in a hopeful manner, that if we believe Jesus is Lord, that he is the only way to be reconciled back to God, that he is the only one that could die on the cross for our sins, my sins, your sins, everyone's sins, but not just die, but resurrect because he is Lord. This belief that Jesus is Lord will give you hope and it will save you forever and you get to spend an eternity with God in heaven. That is how Jesus can save you. And maybe the spirit is prodding you, hey, now's the time to recognize that Jesus is the only one that will save and rescue you, not what you've been trying to do. But there's more. It doesn't end right there. In verse 32 and 33, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Jesus and Peter get into the boat, and the storm stops immediately. Lots of immediately's in this story. Jesus doesn't command the storm to stop like he did earlier in Matthew. It just stops because the I am's power can stop the storm without words. So the disciples have seen the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples have seen the storm get stopped again. This should be the climax of the story, right? This is kind of the climax that I was taught growing up. But it's not the climax of the story. The climax of the story is what happens next. When they recognize and say that Jesus is the son of God. They recognize him as Lord for his power. They recognize and see that he is the one that conquers all. Recognizing Jesus as the son of God. This is the first time that we see him being addressed as the son of God by the disciples. They give this Christological confession altogether because he is Lord. 
And what do they do in the response? Just like my friend John preached last week, we worship him because of that. The disciples worshiped him because of that. And they're not just showing respect to their teacher and friend. They are worshiping him as Lord because they are in awe. They are in amazement. They are in adoration in the presence of their Savior. And so recognizing that Jesus is Lord is the climax of this story. And not just this story, but any story that is ever told. Jesus is Lord. And so the response upon deliverance and recognizing Jesus was to worship him. And not just them, but for us today, as we worship as a church family, we worship Jesus because he is Lord. So what do we do when fear overwhelms us? There has to be some truth that we can use in our minds that we see and receive from the Lord or from Christian fellowship uh, in, in church. And this is it. This sounds really cliche and cheesy and corny, but this is reality. We can't think that prayer is cliche-ish. It is essential. And so when you pray, I'm not talking about just a quick 10-second prayer, but really talk to God when you are in a storm. Let him know your heart. We see in the Psalms that David let God know about his heart all the time. Spend quality intentional time in solitude with him consistently because God wants to hear your questions. He wants to understand and he see why you have your fears and your doubts. I read this quote a few weeks ago by a lady named Brittany Rust. And she says this, does God know what's going on with you because he is omniscient or because you share it with him? Let me say that again because it really convicted me when I was reading it. Does God know what's going on with you because he is omniscient or because you share it with him? You don't just pray. You confess. And when I say confess, I mean confessing your struggles not just with God, but with your brothers and sisters in Christ in your church family. Because you are not meant to struggle alone. You are meant to struggle alongside and that's why it is so essential for us here as a church family to not just come together corporately, but to also have deeper intentional relationships that we get in our grow groups. Because this life is too difficult to get through it alone. And so the beautiful struggle that there is can be had alongside fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Be in community with other brothers and sisters and confess your struggles to one another. You remember the words of Psalm 56, 3, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. And then lastly, remember. Remember that God doesn't want his children to be filled with anxiety and stress and fear. Remember who Jesus is. He is the great I am. This Jesus who multiplied the fish and the loaves. This Jesus who walked on the sea. This Jesus who rescued Peter. Remember him. Remember that goodness. And that way we can keep faith. We can keep hope. And trust that Jesus is near when fear overwhelms us. Remember the words given in 2 Timothy 1.7. That God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this morning for the encouraging words from the Gospel of Matthew that showed us your son's power as he walked on the sea, not just calming the storm, but calming the spirits of the disciples. Father, I pray for any of us who may be in the midst of a storm right now that our first response is to seek out your face, that we will cry out, Lord, save me in our struggles. Father, may we choose to remember your faithfulness in all things even when it's difficult. But Father, may we most always remember the hope that there is in the name of Jesus Christ. The hope of glory if we place our faith in his name alone. Father, we thank you so much for all that you give us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.